May the peace of the Lord be with you. And I hope you're all responded appropriately. Welcome to our service today. Now the theme of our service today is given to us by the Reverend James Garnett in Aberdeen who will be asking us the question later, what is love like? James, we look forward to your ministry with us today. Now, there's more hymns today than we usually have. I think I'm missing hymn singing. So uh, we've got a few more than usual because I'm feeling rather musical. So I think we've got about five hymns. So a mixture of new and a mixture of old. So I hope you uh, enjoy worshipping and singing with us today. So let's begin with our first hymn, our opening hymn, which is the kingdom of God is justice and joy. Let us pray. Lord God, we never know what the future holds or where life will take us next. We never know what is just around the corner and what the outcomes of things will be. But we do know that whatever follows on from this moment, you are here with us, by our side, above us and beneath us, entwining your life with ours surpassing all human understanding. In this moment, bless us and awaken us to your abiding presence. Lord God, faithful and loving, we do not always feel like rejoicing, even as we gather to worship you. Our minds are sometimes distracted elsewhere, weighed down by the burdens of our lives. Help us in this moment to find in you and within our hearts to rejoice in your constancy and loving care for us. People of God, let us rejoice for eternal hope that comes from you, Almighty God. We give you thanks and praise for your gentleness, your compassion for your peace within, for your light in the darkness, for hope when all seems hopeless, 
and for love beyond measure. Let us join together in saying the Lord's Prayer. Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread, and forgive us our trespasses, as we forgive those who trespass against us. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom, the power and the glory, for ever and ever. Amen. The New Testament reading is from Matthew, chapter 22, verses 1 to 14. The parable of the wedding banquet. Jesus spoke to them again in parables, saying, The kingdom of heaven is like a king who prepared a wedding banquet for his son. He sent his servants to those who had been invited to the banquet to tell them to come, but they refused to come. Then he sent some more servants and said, Tell those who have been invited that I have prepared my dinner. My oxen and fattened cattle have been slaughtered and everything is ready. Come to the wedding banquet. But they paid no attention and went off, one to his field, another to his business. The rest seized his servants, ill-treated them and killed them. The king was enraged. He sent his army and destroyed those murderers and burned their city. Then he said to his servants, The wedding banquet is ready, but those I invited I did not deserve to come. Go to the street corner and invite to the banquet anyone you find. So the servants went out into the streets and gathered all the people they could find, both good and bad and the wedding hall was filled with guests. But when the king came in to see the guests, he noticed a man there who was not wearing wedding clothes. Friend, he asked, how did you get in here without wedding clothes? The man was speechless. Then the king told the attendants, tie him hand and foot and throw him outside into the darkness, where there would be weeping and gnashing of teeth. For many are invited, but few are chosen. We thank God for this reading.
This is Exodus chapter 32, and it's the first 14 verses, so verses 1 to 14. And the heading reads, The Gold Bull Calf. When the people saw that Moses had not come down from the mountain, but was staying there a long time, they gathered round Aaron and said to him, We do not know what has happened to this man Moses, who led us out of Egypt, so make us a god to lead us. Aaron said to them, Take off the gold earrings which your wives, your sons and your daughters are wearing, and bring them to me. So all the people took off their gold earrings and brought them to Aaron. He took the earrings, melted them, poured the gold into a mould and made a gold bull calf. The people said, Israel, this is our God, who led us out of Egypt. Then Aaron built an altar in front of the gold bull calf and announced, Tomorrow there will be a festival to honour the Lord. Early the next morning they brought some animals to burn as sacrifices and others to eat as fellowship offerings. People sat down to a feast which turned into an orgy of drinking and sex. The Lord said to Moses, Go back down at once, because your people, whom you have led out of Egypt, have sinned and rejected me. They have already left the way that I commanded them to follow. They have made a bull calf out of melted gold and have worshipped it and offered sacrifices to it. They are saying that this is their God who led them out of Egypt. I know how stubborn these people are. Now don't try to stop me. I am angry with them and I am going to destroy them. Then I will make you and your descendants into a great nation. But Moses pleaded with the Lord, his God, and said, Lord, why should you be so angry with your people, whom you rescued from Egypt with great might and power? Why should the Egyptians be able to say that you led your people out of Egypt, planning to kill them in the mountains and destroy them completely? Stop being angry, change your mind, and do not bring this disaster on your people. Remember your servants Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob. Remember the solemn promise you made to them to give them as many descendants as there are stars in the sky, and to give their descendants all the land that you promised would be their possession forever. So the Lord changed his mind and did not bring on his people the disaster he had threatened. Amen. blood and righteousness I dare not trust the sweetest frame but wholly trust in Jesus name my hope is built on nothing less than Jesus Jesus' blood and righteousness I dare not trust the sweetest frame But wholly trust in Jesus' name Christ alone, cornerstone Savior's love through the storm. He is Lord, Lord of all. When darkness seems to hide his face, I rest on Yeah.
trust in his righteousness alone Faultless stand before the throne What does love look like? The obvious thing to do, of course, is to Google it and see what images come up. When I did that, I found pictures of a kiss, lots of hearts, some couples. The word love cropped up a lot too, which is interesting, isn't it? It tells us that love is difficult to show in a picture because love is a very abstract thing. In fact, it isn't a thing at all, it's a relationship. We cannot see love, only the effects of love and symbols of love. But in times such as those we're living in now, we want more than abstract ideas and symbols, don't we? We need something tangible to hold on to. We need certainties to guide our actions. The story we read in Exodus chapter 32 can help us understand what's going on. Like us, the people of Israel were living in times of uncertainty. Not only had they been traveling in the wilderness for many years, but the man who had led them through all this had been away for more than a month communing with God on the top of Mount Sinai. The people wanted to worship the Lord their God who had brought them safely out of Egypt. But this was an invisible God and his usual representative, Moses, was nowhere to be seen. In the absence of any tangible focus for their worship, the people made an image of a calf, and this made God angry. Note what caused God's anger, though. It was not that they were worshipping a different God. The Hebrew of this passage makes it clear that the festival and its sacrifices were for Yahweh, Neither was having some form of visual focus for worship an issue. After all, Moses was about to come down from the mountain with instructions for building the tabernacle. The problem arose from attempting to make an image of God. An image is both more and less than the original it represents. Less because although the picture of a young bull may have portrayed something of the strength and virility of God, there are other divine features it did not capture, wisdom and gentleness, for example. Yet an image also has the potential to become more than the original, taking on symbolic significance in its own right. There was a danger that this image of a calf would become a symbol for Israel's survival in the wilderness and become the object of their devotion instead of the God it represented. This is exactly what happened with Nehushtan, the bronze image of a serpent that Moses had made to repel the snakes in the wilderness, and which became an object of worship until King Hezekiah broke it into pieces. We read of this in 2 Kings chapter 18. The problem is that we humans think in images, including words. We represent the world around us in words and pictures, in music and movement. Each image is both less and more than the original. And it is precisely these differences that give us meaning. 
We can see this in the way that we talk of Jesus Christ, the word made flesh. Jesus, both less and more than his namesake Joshua, son of Nun, who led Israel after the death of Moses. Christ, both less and more than the long-awaited Messiah, descendant of David. Word, both less than the words God spoke to bring heaven and earth into being, and yet also more, because this word was made flesh and dwelt among us. No one has ever seen God, we read in John chapter 1, verse 18. It is God, the only Son, who is close to the Father's heart, who has made him known. In Jesus Christ, the person, we have not the image, but the actuality of love. So what does love look like? During these difficult times, we might be tempted to elevate particular images of love to the status of a golden calf. Our families, for example, might easily become our top priority and the focus for all our attention. Or the NHS, to be preserved at all costs as the embodiment of care for the weak and the vulnerable. Or even our churches, whether we understand them as buildings, online services or as communities. We are capable of making any of these things, and many of us too, into an image of love that is both less and more than love itself. We then pour our time, energy and resources into this image at the expense of all else. We protect our chosen image, neglecting or even denouncing other images of love. But the good news is that in Christ, love has taken the form of a person. And we can encounter that person in the most surprising of places, even among those who might appear not to have been invited to life's wedding banquet. We can see the word made flesh in acts of kindness, in sacrifices made, in evils challenged, in mistakes forgiven. And whenever we notice these things, whenever we do them, we learn something of what it means to be the person of Jesus Christ. When we witness these acts of love for what they are, and when we experience them for ourselves, we don't just see what love looks like. We become more like love itself.
Let us now turn to God in our prayers of intercession. O God, we come to pray not for ourselves, but for each other. For those that we know and those that we don't. For situations we understand and for those that confound us. The news tells us of trauma and heartache across the world and we try to grasp the intensity of it all. Bless, O oh Lord, all involved in the hurting and in the healing. We hear of death and dying, of grieving and weeping. We hear of pain, scarring and disfigurement. We hear of anguish and confusion. We hear of those in need of help and those who struggle to find it. We hear of the grieving and the sorrowful. We hear of the lost and the alone. And we know, Lord, there are myriad others known only to you. In the silence, let's bring before God those that we know that need our prayers at this moment. Holy God, comforting God, bless them all in their hurting and their healing. Amen. As we come again to the end of our service, I want to thank, as usual, all those who took part today. Especially to James for his message to us about love. To Robert, as always, for playing beautifully for us in one of the hymns. To Irene and to John for their readings from the Bible. And to all of you for worshipping together with us today. And most especially, I want to thank God for his immeasurable love for us all. Look forward to worshipping with you again in the coming weeks. But let's end with a song all I can say is an anthem of praise, a modern anthem of praise to the God we worship. Simply, how great is our God? The splendor of the King Clothed in majesty let all the earth rejoice, all the earth rejoice He wraps himself in light And darkness tries to hide And trembles at his voice, trembles at his voice How great is our God Sing with me how our God, and all will see how great, how great is our God. Age to age He stands, and time is in His hands, beginning and the end, beginning and the end. God
sing with me how great is our God And all will see how great, how great is our God May the grace of our Lord Jesus Christ, the love of God and the fellowship of the Holy Spirit be with us all evermore. Amen.